So far in this series, we covered the four basic forces acting on an aircraft and made our first takeoff. But when we climb or descend in an aircraft, we're going to see some things change. And like a lot of aviation-related topics, it goes back to those four forces. So what exactly is going on, and how can we use those forces to do vertical aerobatic maneuvers? We'll answer those questions in this video. This is how the four forces of flight are usually depicted. And it's a good way to explain how they interact with an aircraft flying straight and level at a constant speed. In other words, when the forces are in equilibrium. For the aircraft to climb or descend, the forces need to be out of equilibrium. So in a climb, they would look more like this. Thrust and drag are aligned with the direction of travel, so they're now tilted at an angle. Lift is always perpendicular to the direction of airflow, so it's now also off at an angle. But weight stayed exactly the same because the pull of gravity is always straight down regardless of where the aircraft is pointed. So why is this important? It's important because now drag has a downward component. That means that part of the aircraft's weight is acting together with drag to counteract thrust. So if you are flying at a constant speed with just enough thrust to balance out drag when you transition into a climb, the amount of thrust would no longer be enough. This would lead to a loss of speed. Just like driving up a hill, you need to add power if you want to maintain speed. The amount of power needed goes up as you increase the angle of the climb. It tops out in a pure vertical climb where the amount of thrust required to stay airborne is equal to the weight of the aircraft. One other thing that happens in a climb is a temporary increase in lift. Right after pulling back on the controls, the angle of attack will be higher, generating more lift. But as soon as the airflow stabilizes in the new direction of travel, that angle of attack will return to a lower level. We can see that here when we put the sim's built-in AOA indicator on the screen. It gets a temporary bump right after we pull back on the stick, but then it falls back to a level closer to where it was as the airflow stabilizes in this new direction. This also happens when pulling out of a dive where it has a more noticeable effect. After a dive, you'll have built up speed just like driving down a hill. So when you pitch the aircraft up to avoid hitting the ground, you're going to have momentum still pulling you toward it. This will shift the oncoming flow of air from this region in front of the wing during normal flight to a lower part of the wing. Another way to describe this is as an increase in angle of attack. If it gets too high, we'll cross our critical angle of attack. When that happens, the wing stops generating lift and starts creating a lot of drag. The only way to get out of that is to decrease angle of attack, which you generally don't want to do while flying towards the ground. So the lesson here is to moderate your speed when in a dive. Now when you push the controls forward, you get the opposite effect as what we just discussed. There will be a temporary decrease in lift because angle of attack will have a momentary decrease as the aircraft noses down into the airflow. There's another change in angle of attack that happens at the back of the plane that's important to understand. When you push the stick forward or backward, it moves these control surfaces on the miniature wings at the back of the plane. These wings are called the horizontal stabilizers because of how they're mounted and the stabilizing effect they have on the aircraft. And the control surfaces at the rear are known as elevators. Forward stick pressure deflects the elevators downward. This changes the cord line, which is at the heart of angle of attack. Since the downward deflection raised the angle of attack of this rear wing, it's naturally going to generate more lift and raise the tail. This is why forward stick pressure appears to move the nose down. Conversely, back stick pressure brings the elevators upward. Now we have a unique situation where this downward pointing cord line creates a negative angle of attack. It might seem confusing, but what's happening here is really a positive angle of attack pointing downward. So we have lift generated, but in the opposite direction. And as you would expect, this brings the tail down and the nose upward. So forward and back on the stick shouldn't be thought of as up and down for an aircraft. It's actually a control for angle of attack. Now there's one final concept we want to know before we jump into aerobatics, and it's called load factor. Anytime force is applied to an aircraft to deflect it from straight and level flight, it's going to produce stress on the airframe. The amount of that stress is called load factor, and it's measured in G's, with 1 G being equivalent to what you feel either standing on the surface of the earth or in straight and level flight. Just like in an elevator or on a roller coaster, you feel the force of acceleration when you're moved away from equilibrium. The same effect is happening when you maneuver in an aircraft. You can visualize it by imagining you're sitting on a scale while flying the aircraft. In straight and level flight, you would experience 1 G, and that would be reflected on the scale you're sitting on by showing 1 times your body weight. 
But if you pitch the aircraft up, then your body would want to continue on that straight and level path, just like Newton's laws of motion state. You would experience acceleration upward, and if it was enough to reach 2G, then the scale you were sitting on would show twice your body weight. 3G would make it three times your body weight. Your body has limits to how much acceleration it can take. The average person can take between 4 and 6G before the flow of blood out of the brain towards the feet causes a loss of consciousness. You can increase that tolerance with good fitness, a G-suit that compresses the legs during high G maneuvering, and a special breathing method along with the constriction of lower body muscles known as the anti-G straining maneuver, or AGSM for short. Using all these together, it's possible for pilots to tolerate up to 9 Gs. Pulling too many positive Gs is bad, but so is pulling negative Gs. With the pull of acceleration in the opposite direction, blood flows towards the head, increasing pressure there. This can cause small blood vessels in the eyes and brain to burst. DCS models this as a blackout like what you would see with high positive Gs, except that it happens when you pull negative Gs. The important thing to remember here is that this only applies to negative G, not to the spectrum between 0 and 1G. It's okay to go below the 1G of level flight, so a gentle drop of the nose is permissible. This is called bunting the aircraft, but try to avoid going below 0 into the negatives. That's when bad things start to happen and your aircraft is much better at pulling positive Gs than negative Gs. But it's not just the human body that has G load tolerances. The aircraft also has G limits, which we can see on a chart like this VG diagram. At the bottom we see airspeed, and on the left is the load factor. We can plot out how our aircraft would react at various load factors and speeds. In straight and level flight we would be on this 1G line, but if we entered this area we would be maneuvering with such a high angle of attack that the aircraft would stall. Out in these orange and red regions, we would put enough force on the airframe to damage it, so we want to avoid those regions. If you've ever seen the wings come off a plane in DCS from hard maneuvering, then they were in this region. Here's the VG diagram for the MB339 trainer we've been using in this series. We can see there's a max permissible load factor of 8G. One thing I need to point out here is that Zone D has some special caveats. You cannot have any underwing weapons or fuel tanks loaded and the tip tank should be removed. Otherwise, you're limited to Zone B, which is 7G. Always check for these special rules on any aircraft you operate. As we do our vertical maneuvers, we want to keep these limits in mind. And for that, we have this accelerometer located on our instrument panel. You'll want to keep an eye on this one anytime you do hard maneuvers. So let's get started with our aerobatics. The first one we're going to try out is known as the Immelman turn which is named after the World War I fighter ace, Max Immelman. It's a fairly simple maneuver that's meant to put you on a course opposite of where you started. You can think of it as a U-turn in the vertical plane. This maneuver has three parts. First, you start in straight and level flight. In wings level flight, it's a lot easier to stay in a perfectly vertical plane. So we want to try to maintain wings level throughout the maneuver. The next phase involves pulling up into the vertical for half a circle. At this point, you'll be on a reciprocal heading, flying in the opposite direction you came from. But you'll be upside down. So the last step is to roll upright to wings level. Now let's see it from inside the cockpit. The Immelman can be started at any altitude in level flight, but we want to have at least 320 knots of speed when we start the loop. You can set the throttle to max power and dive slightly to help reach this speed. Make a note of the heading you start at. In this case, we're on a heading of 360, which is directly north. Once we're sure we have enough speed and the wings are level, we're going to gently pull back on the stick. Since we want to do these maneuvers uniformly, we need a way to make sure the amount of pull is the same each time. So we're going to use the accelerometer for that and pull until it reads 4G. Then we're going to maintain that until we've completed our turn. Just like with everything else, we want to be smooth. So ease the stick back until you reach 4G and then hold it there as best as you can. One thing you'll notice during this maneuver is that once you lose enough speed, you won't be able to maintain 4G. That's normal. Just apply as much back stick pressure as you can at that point and complete the maneuver. We're sticking to 4G for a couple reasons. One is to keep us under the maximum load factor allowed for the airframe. 8G is the max for this aircraft without any underwing stores. 
Two, it gives us a way to measure how sharply we're turning so we can repeat the turn with the same performance each time. Remember that when we pull back on the stick, we're moving the elevators at the back of the plane and changing the angle of attack. AOA and G are linked. If we pull more AOA, then it's going to make the turn sharper and increase induced drag, which we covered in this video. That means higher G and more loss speed. Lower G means less loss speed, but also a slower turn. Sticking to 4G should give us a nice balance between the two. Throughout the climb, you notice the speed begins to drop because now we have gravity and drag working together to counter our thrust. That's normal, but it can make it difficult to maintain G throughout the maneuver. Speed and G also have a relationship. If you want the same turn rate at a higher speed, you will need to pull more G. For this exercise, just hold it as close to 4G as you can until we're fully inverted. Once we're at the top, we want to roll over to return to level flight. That's it. We've completed our Immelman turn. If you did everything right, you should be on a heading of 180, which is due south and the reciprocal of our starting heading. Our speed is also a lot lower. That's normal too. Remember that drag and the pull of gravity were working together during the climbing part of that maneuver. We'll see another big change in speed with our next maneuver, which is called the split S. The downward counterpart to the Immelman is known as the split S. Just like the Immelman, you're going to maneuver in the vertical plane and end up on the reciprocal heading at the end. Only this time we'll be diving instead of climbing. Before we start, there's a couple things we need to keep in mind that didn't apply to the Immelman. First is our starting altitude. Since we don't want to hit the ground, we need enough room for our maneuver. Start at 8,000 feet and make sure there aren't any mountains under you. Flying over our coastline should be safe. Second, you don't want to begin this maneuver going too fast. As we dive, we're going to gain speed, and if you start this above 300 knots, it's very easy to reach the red never exceed speed line on our airspeed indicator. Going over that speed makes the aircraft very unresponsive, and that's something you don't want in a dive. So for this exercise, we'll start at 250 knots. We'll begin by rolling out of level flight until we're completely inverted like this. Then we'll pull into a steady 4G pull with the throttle at maximum. Typically, you wouldn't do a descending maneuver with the throttle at maximum, but there's a specific point I want to make here that requires it. Keep the turn as close to 4G as you can and hold it until your wings level flying the opposite heading. At the end, you should be somewhere near 3,000 feet of altitude and have quite a bit more speed. Now remember that number because we're going to do this split S exercise again, but with one small difference. We'll change the speed, and I want you to see what happens. We're back at 8,000 feet, only this time our speed is just under 200 knots. Before we begin, I'm going to pull the throttle back to idle. Again, we're going to roll inverted and maintain as close to 4G as we can. Now look where our altitude ends up. It's almost 2,000 feet above our last attempt. So there's an important lesson to learn here. The radius of our maneuver is determined by speed and G. Changing either of those changes how big the arc is. If you pull more G, that will decrease the radius, just like if you reduce speed. Less G or more airspeed will make that circle bigger. Remember this when you're maneuvering close to the ground. This also holds true in horizontal turns, and you can see it depicted here in this set of graphics. The aircraft moving at 120 knots has a turn radius small enough to stay within the walls of this canyon, but the same maneuver at 140 knots ends up hitting the wall. Remember, speed and G affect turn radius. We learned quite a bit about turning in today's video. While we focused on vertical maneuvers, many of the concepts also apply to horizontal turns. That'll be the topic of the next video, where I'll show you how professional pilots make their turns exactly the same each time. So I look forward to having you back for that one. And thanks for watching.